Oh, way to go. In the first service, I, uh, I went in my Kindle, and I, I cheated, and I went to Google and looked it up. And sure enough, that song is on iTunes, and you can buy that. And she won't let me tell that, but I'm doing it anyway, because I think the lyrics to that are awesome. And I'm going to put it on our church uh, website this week, too. Who knew that in 2009, when she was writing that song, that God had given her a, a song that's so perfect for the sermon today? And, and you'll see what I mean as we kind of go through this. But uh, powerful, powerful words. Well, many of you have been 29 at some point in your life, and you dream of being 29 again. It's impossible, okay? It's, it's not going to happen. If you've passed it, you, you can't go back. Some of you think 29 is years and years and years away, and you're going to be really old when you reach that spot. And to you, I say, uh, you're not really that old when you're 29. When I was 29 years old, I was a youth pastor at a church in Illinois. I was working way too many hours. I had a boss who didn't like me. In fact, he didn't like any of his staff. He was really tough on us. In five years, he fired three music directors. He had uh, seven of us on staff. And by the time I left, uh, there was only one left, and he left a few months after me. And uh, it was just tough. I was the father of three young children, including a newborn baby boy named Jeremy. We had been through a difficult pregnancy before him and, and lost a baby. I was leading a volunteer team of a dozen or so adults, most of whom were older than me and uh, intimidated me a little bit. I uh, was being told constantly by my wife, uh, you need to work less, your kids aren't seeing you, I'm not seeing you, and life's out of control here, Bri. And it had been some difficult years. And strangely, God's blessing was on my life, um, even though I felt inadequate, insecure, more than a bit hypocritical. I felt like I was leading people, but I wasn't really sure where I was leading them to. We were just kind of going with the motions and reacting instead of planning. And I was getting by because of my personality and my natural abilities a whole lot more than because of my dependence upon God. And I was a little bit like the man who would be Israel's future king was at age 29. Last week, I introduced you to David, the shepherd boy, whom Samuel anointed as the next king of Israel. He was this guy who nobody would have thought was going to be king. There was nothing about his outward appearance that at least said, hey, this is the next king of Israel. He was the youngest of Jesse's boys, and God told Samuel, you'll recall last week, hey, I don't look in the outer appearance, I look at the heart, and that's the one that I want to be the next king. And we see almost immediately how God uses him to get improbable victory after improbable victory, beginning with this giant named Goliath, who he defeats, this champion warrior from Gath of the Philistines. And David was just at a really good spot. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He was experiencing victory after victory in his life. And it didn't take long for the current king, a guy named Saul, who was a little bit of an egomaniac, to take notice of the young David. He became a son-in-law to the king, this David, and because of Saul's intense jealousy, he also became public enemy number one. Some of you have a father-in-law that makes you feel like public enemy number one, and I feel bad for you if that's where, where you're at in life. But you have probably never had a father-in-law who wanted to take your life. Saul hated David, and he wanted him dead. And ten years have now passed since the teenage David defeated Goliath. And for 10 years, David has lived on and off as a fugitive. He's now 29 years old. He has 600 men who are following him, many of whom started following him at that victory over Goliath. They believe in him. They see something in him. They believe he's going to be the next king of Israel. Some of them are following David because of their wives. Their wives saw David, and they saw something special in David. In fact, the women created this song about David. And they would sing it, and I won't because nobody knows how it goes, but it was Saul that's killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands, and honey, why can't you be more like David? So go follow him and uh, become a great leader like him. He was a threat to Saul, a hope to the Jewish people, a natural leader. Women loved him, men admired him, the Holy Spirit empowered him, and other nations feared him. And David shouldn't have worried about a thing because God had his back. He was God's chosen man to lead the, lead the Israelites' people. God had protected him for years so far, and he led like a champion. But in 1 Samuel 27 through 30, there's this dark chapter in the life of David where something just snaps. One pastor has written a sermon, and he entitled his sermon, when, uh, he entitled his sermon A Missing Persons Report. Because in these few chapters of David's life, you see that God is conspicuously absent from David's thought processes. This man after God's own heart has somehow chosen to ignore God. 
David allowed the discouragement of his situation to impact him, and it led to some incredibly negative consequences. Donnie DeLay tells a story about this. He says, once upon a time, the devil decided that he was going to host a garage sale. I want to guarantee you, at our Woodbury Community Church garage sale in a few weeks, we're not going to take any of the devil's stuff, all right? We we don't want it, but uh, he had a garage sale. He decided to clear out some of his old tools to make room for some new ones, and uh, some fellow shows up at the garage sale to see what the devil has for sale. And he gets to the garage sale, he notices uh, that each tool has a price tag, and he sees the shiny implement labeled Anger $250 and passes it by, and next to it is a curved tool named Sloth for $380. And as the man searched, he found criticism for $500, jealousy for $630. And then in the corner of his eye, he spots a beaten up tool with a price tag for $12,000. And he's curious and he wants to see what in the world the devil could be selling for $12,000. And he says, why would anybody want this worn out piece of junk? Why are you selling this for such an exorbitant price? And the devil said it was expensive because he used it so much. And the man said, well, what is it? And the answer came back, it's discouragement. It always works when nothing else will. And you know, the devil must have felt like nothing was working with David. The Holy Spirit was empowering him and helping him make decisions. And David just experienced, had just experienced in the previous month, three incredible victories. The first victory happened in 1 Samuel 24. King Saul is right where David should have wanted him. He's the king, and he has to do what all human beings have to do from time to time. He has to use the facilities. So he decides he's going to go relieve himself, and he's the king. So he goes to a cave in En Gedi to relieve himself, and he's the king, so nobody goes in there with him. And uh, David is hiding out, and he's at a spot where he can see King Saul and all these men as they're pursuing him and wanting to kill him. And David decides that he's going to do something that I don't think I would have ever made the decision to do. He's going to sneak into the cave. And while Saul is relieving himself, he decides that he's going to cut a corner of the robe off. And uh, he's going to prove to Saul, listen, I could have killed you right there, but I'm not going to lay my hand on God's anointed. And so Saul finishes his business, and David kind of follows him and shows him this this corner of his robe and says, listen, I I could have killed you, but I'm not going to touch you. Can you please stop hunting for me? I mean, this is ridiculous. And Saul, you know, basically says, oh, you know, David, you're so wonderful. You could have killed me. Of course I won't kill you. And, but Saul's nuts. And, and Saul then decides, no, the butchery is going to continue. We're going to try to kill this guy. He lets David get away at that point, but the hunt starts again. At 1 Samuel 25, David spares this guy Nabal's life. And uh, Nabal is, is a guy that uh, Abigail intercedes for, and God eventually avenges David, and uh, he takes the life of Nabal, who was a threat to David, and David doesn't have to do it, and he experiences another victory. And then in 1 Samuel 26, again, David spares Saul's life. He's got Saul in a spot that uh, Saul is vulnerable. He's watching, and Saul has fallen asleep, and Saul actually sleeps with his sword underneath him, because or his spear. He is so worried about the other nations. He's worried about David and his men. So David's the one being hunted, but Saul's a little paranoid. And David sneaks down to the camp, while Saul's asleep, and the Bible says that God caused the king and his men to be in such a deep sleep that they didn't even notice when David took the spear right underneath of Saul. And David goes to the other side of a mountain. He shouts down to Abner, who was the general for Saul. He says, hey, Abner, look what I have. I've got the spear of of Saul. Listen, I'm not going to take his life, and I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. In the end of 1 Samuel 25, we read this. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because of my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here's the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put my hand out against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious to me in this day, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went in his way, and Saul returned to his place. And things continued to go well for David, which makes verse 1 of the next chapter so amazing. Out of nowhere, David, who's experiencing all this victory, has discouragement and fear creep on him and blindside him. 
Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul would despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. Listen, there's some lessons here for all of us. First of all, discouragement can absolutely distort our perspective. Discouragement can absolutely distort our perspective. For David, it began when he started to think long and hard about his station in life. He's 29 years old. He spent more than a third of his life on the lamb, and he was tired of running. One pastor puts it this way. No one could blame him for feeling down. We've all been in the same place, but this time his mind jumps from one negative to another. At last, he reaches a hopeless conclusion. One of these days, Saul is going to get me. I don't know when or where or how, but I can't run like this forever. It may not come from a year. It may not, for a year, it may, not hap- it may happen tomorrow, but as sure as sunrise, it's going to happen. The future looks bleak because he has decided to focus on the negative instead of the positive. And we can excuse and even understand such thinking, except for one really big thing. God had promised David that he'd be Israel's next king. This wasn't a prediction the way that political pundits predict the next president. It was rock solid. It was a rock solid promise and David could take it to the bank meaning that Saul would never kill him no matter how bleak the circumstances might appear. But David chooses to focus on his own resources instead of God's promises. And as a result, he completely loses his perspective on life. Listen, discouragement didn't just distort David's perspective. It led David to make a stupid decision. His solution to the problem was to go live with the Philistine people. Do you remember where Goliath came from? Goliath was a champion of Gath, which was a city in Philistia. It was, it was a Philistine city. David thought, I'm going to be safer living among the chief enemies of the Jewish people than I am going to be living with the people that God has told me that I'm going to someday serve as king. It would be like a general in the United States Army who has been pretty much promised the presidency. His popularity is high. Everybody likes him better than the current president. The current president's jealous and is making threats behind the scenes. But God has his back. And the guy says, you know what? I'm going to go live amongst the Taliban for a while because the current president wants me dead. Maybe if I live with the enemies, the terrorists, I'll be better off. I mean, you talk about a distorted way of looking at things. Now, David was convinced that what he was doing was honorable. When we're under pressure... We can sometimes talk ourselves into justifying any number of stupid things. He rationalized himself, if I live amongst the Philistines, at least Saul's going to quit chasing me. And if you've been following along in the challenge, you know that this isn't the first time that David has used the Philistine solution. In 1 Samuel 21, David lived with the Philistines for a little while, and it did not go well for him. Listen to the story. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart, and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate. And he let spittle run down his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David pretended to be a crazy man so that Achish, the leader of the region, would think that he was nuts and have pity on him. Not the way that the future leader of the Jewish nation would have wanted to instill fear in the lives of the enemy. Slobbering all over your beard doesn't exactly instill fear in anybody. In his distorted thinking, David makes the same mistake all over again. He chooses to live with the enemy rather than trust God's plan uh, that he had assured of his survival. It serves as a lesson for all of us. When we make a compromise like David did in 1 Samuel 21, it becomes really easy to make that same compromise again when the pressure is on. When we fall for sin once, it's really easy to go back to the same well and go back to that same sin over and over again. David's distorted thinking made spiritual compromise an acceptable option. His distorted thinking made spiritual compromise an acceptable option. 
God had told the Jewish people they, that they, under no circumstances were they to mix with their neighbors to the north or the south or the east or the west. These were his chosen people. They were set apart to follow him. They were different. They were God's people. And every time the children of Israel would mix with the neighbors, disastrous things would happen. They'd begin to worship idols. They'd begin to intermarry. They'd begin to experience all these things that God had said uh, is nothing that his children were supposed to do. But despite his knowledge of all the bad history, David compromised. And I'm sure he had plenty of excuses as to why. But you know what? Our excuses are just that. They're excuses. And they never hold up in the court of heaven. Compromising God's law or his values for our comfort or our security is never a good thing. And it might be where you're at today. It could be that on this Sunday morning, you look at your life and you say, yeah, my life lately has been characterized by one compromise after another. My taxes are due tomorrow and I'm compromising on my taxes. My uh, boss wants me to do this and I compromise at work because it's my boss and he's asking me to do it. I'm compromising in relationships because, you know what, I just feel better being with somebody even though I know it's not the person God would want me to be with. Because, hey, at least I have found love. Or we figure out all sorts of excuses to live our lives the way that uh, we think are going to be best for us. It may be that David, as is, it may be that like David, it's the result of distorted thinking that has come because of discouragement, but it's wrong nonetheless. Deloney writes, discouragement does that. It leads us slowly downward until we end up doing things that we would have never dreamed of. What starts as a fleeting thought becomes a plan, and a plan becomes a commitment, and eventually a commitment becomes a lifestyle. David's compromise had some immediate results, and some of those compromises, some of the results were surprising. Number one is this, his compromise impacted others. If you look at verse 2, it says, So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. David's decisions had ramifications for those that he led. 600 men now had to follow their leader into the land of the Philistines. I suppose they didn't have to, but if they went back to Israel without him, they were kind of messed up, and so they followed. And those 600 men had children, and they had wives, and that means that well over 1,000, maybe 2,000, maybe more people are now living with the enemy because of David's decision. They would be living with the very king who thought that David was crazy in 1 Samuel 21. They'd be living in Goliath's home region. Listen, when we compromise, we often take others with us. Dads, when we compromise, it impacts our family. Bosses, when we compromise, it impacts the people who work for us. Students, when you compromise in school, it impacts your future. It impacts your grades. It impacts how you're going to do in your career. When I was in high school, I was known amongst my friends for having a really strong testimony in my first few years of high school. I'd gone to a Christian school through eighth grade. I said, I'm going to make a stance for Christ. I'm going to live for him to be a light on this campus. And my freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I really was. I had friends come unto Christ. I was bringing people to my student ministry. I was known as the good guy. And I was constantly being pressured by my friends who weren't Christians. They said, Shulamber, you never swear. You never tell a dirty joke. You never watch a dirty movie. You never go with us to parties. And they tease me, and they, finally, after time, I just kind of caved. In my senior year, I decided, you know what, I'm going to be like everybody else. And so I started going to some parties my senior year of high school that I knew I didn't have any business being at. And I remember one night, I went to a friend's house. His parents were out of town. He said, hey, let's have like five or six people over. And I said, can I tell some really cute girls? And he said, sure. So I told some really cute girls who then told the football team. And before the night was over, the party got out of hand. There were about 75 people in a house, and the neighbors, uh, and there was alcohol all over the place, and the neighbors called the police. And there were three guys who I had mentored my freshman, sophomore, and junior year of high school who were with me that night, and I led them to a really bad spot. We're lying to the police, we're hiding bottles of alcohol, and one of the girls that I worked with who had a crush on me decided that she was going to come to the party too. And that night, one of my friends decided to use her in the bathroom of that home. And she lost her virginity. And I look at that period of my life, and it makes me sick. It makes me sad. It makes me realize I wasted some incredible opportunities, all because of compromise. My compromise, no matter the excuses that I was making to justify it, ended up bringing a world of hurt to some of the people in my life. Okay, well, David's compromise didn't just impact others. His compromise at first seemed to be a really wise decision. Isn't that weird how that can happen? You make a compromise, you do the wrong thing, and 
even though you know it's the wrong thing, somehow some good things come out of it? See, sometimes God allows good things to come out of our really bad choices. And if you read verses 4 to 6, it looks like David's compromise wasn't all that bad. In verse 4, Saul quits the search for David. In verses 5 and 6, David and his people are given an entire village to live in. David essentially becomes a prince among the Philistine people, given an entire city to rule over, the city of Ziklag. And for the first time in years, he doesn't feel like a fugitive. For the first time in years, he isn't having to sleep with one eye open, you know, constantly wondering if there's somebody that's going to come kill him in the middle of the night. His men seem happy. The women seem happy. He's got a good thing going. And Achish, the king of Gath, who thought that David was a certifiable nutcase in 1 Samuel 21, actually thinks, hey, this guy's pretty cool. And why wouldn't he? Because in verses 8 through 11, we read that David's compromise led him into a pattern of deceit, which led to needless death. Deloney describes it better than I could. He says, verses 8 through 11 describe raiding parties that David had while he was living at Ziklag. And you need to know a little bit of the geography to get the picture. So on the map here on the screen, you see Ziklag in the southwestern part here of the map. And uh, he says, Ziklag was a tiny village off the wilderness between Gaza and Beersheba. And David would take his men and he'd raid the villages to the south and the southwest of Ziklag. But when Achish asks, where did you go raiding today? David would answer, I've been to the Negev of Judah, which is to the south and the east. The implication of David's answer was that he'd been raiding his own people, the nation of Israel, when actually he'd been going in the opposite direction. But the deception served the purpose of convincing Achish that he was truly loyal to him. It doesn't seem like such a big deal until you read verse 11. He did not leave a man or a woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. So it starts as a plundering party, gets some wealth, gets some money, steals some of the stuff from the other lands. After all, we're God's chosen people. But it starts as a plundering party, ends up in a bloody slaughter. After all, dead men tell no tales. But are you surprised? Because that's what happens when discouragement leads us to compromise. When David attacked those villages, he did it without God's permission, without provocation, under false pretenses, and with unnecessary cruelty. David is caught in this downward spiral, and the worst is still to come. See, David would learn a hard lesson that so many of us have learned. Sin is really fun for a season. Sin is fun for a season. It really is. If it wasn't, there wouldn't be so many people that run to it and pursue it. It wouldn't be such a temptation. It wouldn't be one of those tools that Satan uses in our life. If it weren't fun, none of us would go there. Sin can bring us instant satisfaction. It can bring escape. It can bring excitement. It can bring temporary pleasure. But hear me, sin always has consequences. And for David, those consequences would come in 1 Samuel 28, verses 1 and 2, when he found himself in what looked like an impossible situation. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. David's deceit had come back to bite him. He was now going to be forced to fight against Israel, something that Achish was convinced that he had been doing for the better part of 16 months. David never intended to let it get this far. He was just looking for safety from Saul. He just wanted some peace and quiet. He wanted a good night's sleep. He wanted relief. He wanted his people to be happy. He didn't want to fight Israel. I mean, for Pete's sake, this was the country that God had called him to lead. And now he's supposed to go to war with them. He was supposed to be their king. He was adored by the people of Israel, just not by the king. What would his father think? What would the old priest Samuel, who had anointed him, think? By the way, in the next verse, you read that Samuel died. What would Jonathan, Saul's son, and David's best friend think? And I don't know if you caught it, but David was to be the bodyguard of Achish. He said, you're going to be my bodyguard for life. Doesn't sound like a prince of a region to me. It sounds like a bit of a slave. He was told that he'd be the bodyguard for life for the king of Gath. God said that David would be the king of Israel. And God was going to see his will accomplished, but David had no concept of how that could ever happen now. His compromise had made an impossible mess of things. Deloney writes, In his mind, going to live with the Philistines was just a temporary maneuver to buy some time and some space, but now he was faced with the full result of his compromise. Unless God intervenes, he will be forced to fight against his own people. 
But that's what happens whenever you live your life apart from God. One little step leads to another. One tiny compromise opens the door to another. And before you know it, you find yourself in too deep to get out. And when that happens, you think, it's okay, I'll make it. But you won't. By now, David is too indebted to Achish to even think about backing out. He's the perfect picture of a carnal man operating on his own resources. David's hit rock bottom. As far as he's concerned, it can't get any worse. And if, he comes, and if it comes to it, as the bodyguard of the king of Gath, it was the job of the bodyguard whenever you fought another army. The bodyguard would then take the life of the opposing king if he won in battle. So his job would be to take the life of Saul, the very thing he had refused to do for the last 10 years. He's in a tough spot. How's he going to help his men get out of this one? How's he going to talk his way out of it? The answer is that he wouldn't. He couldn't. And the men who are with him had to be furious. They've got to be saying, David, what have you done? Where have you led us? Did you have any concept of what you were doing? You're supposed to be a man after God's own heart. You're supposed to be this incredible leader. Our wives think you're it. And we followed you. And look what's happened. You've brought us to this incredibly difficult spot. Your sin has impacted us. And now if we don't go into battle against our own country, we're going to get slaughtered by the Philistines. And if we go with the Philistines, we're going to be traitors to our country and we're going to kill brothers and sisters that we love. And here's how the battle played out. David and his men are with Achish and his men, and in God's sovereignty, he puts them at the very back of the line. So this huge Philistine army is going out. They're ready to go into war with the Jewish people. And as they're going in 1 Samuel 29, 3 through 5, the generals of Achish say, Hey, Achish, can we have a word? A little conference here. We need to talk. What in the world is David doing with us? This is what they said. The commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us in the battle, lest in battle he become an adversary for us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is this not David of whom they sang to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. In other words, there have been ten thousands of us, the Philistines, killed by this guy. You might like him. You might think he's a great little leader for Ziklag and your personal bodyguard, but we want nothing of this guy in our life. So Achish has a word with David, and he basically tells him, you're out. My men won't fight with you, and I need to have the backing of my men. Go back to Ziklag, and you can fight with us in the next battle, but you're not going to have to fight against the Israelites. God worked it out. God worked it out when David couldn't work it out. He didn't have to fight the Israelites. And so as they work their way back to Ziklag, David's probably like, ha, see, I got us. I, I, we're, we're good. Nothing to worry about here. See, I do exactly where I was leading them. And then they see the smoke. As they get closer to their village, they realize that while they were gone, Ziklag has been attacked. And it's been attacked by the Amalekites, the very people that David had been attacking when he said he was attacking the Israelites. They want revenge. They burn the entire city to the ground. All their possessions, their homes, gone. And their wives and their children, they're taken on a caravan back to the home of the Amalekites. And David and his men are heartbroken. These men have been so faithful to David, protecting him from King Saul for the better part of ten years, are so furious with David that they even talk about stoning him. We talk about David's mighty men a lot. In the future weeks here, we're going to be on David's life for a little bit here. We're going to talk about these men and what they would do for David. But they are so frustrated with him right now. They want to pick up rocks. They want to chuck it at him. They want him dead. It's their wives that are gone. It's their children that are gone. They're wondering what horrible things are happening to them. Deloney writes, what started with, the discour with discouragement led to desperation, which led to defection, which led to disobedience, which culminated in disaster. Now God is beginning to, let, to get David's attention. Sometimes the Lord has to do that in order to get through to us. Disaster comes when we stand in the blackened, smoking, ruined parts of our lives. And at last we come to our senses. After 16 months of compromise and disobedience, David finally begins to look up. 
The tragedy is that it took so long and it hurt so many people. And he finally turns his life around. And the turning point comes so quickly that we might miss it. In 1 Samuel 36, it says that David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength because he was no longer relying on his own strength. David's number one problem from the beginning was that he was so gifted that he could operate very successfully on his own for a time, apart from God. We know that he was handsome and strong and a gifted musician and a mighty warrior, and women were attracted to him. He was a born leader. David had it all. He was every woman's dream and every man's hero. In later years, those qualities would make him a natural great king. But the reason God put David through 10 years of obscurity in the desert was to teach him, hey, David, it's not enough to rely on those natural abilities that I've given you, the good looks, all of that. You've got to rely on me and me alone. And as long as David leaned on the Lord, those enormous gifts could be used to accomplish great ends. But every time David leaned in his own strength to get the job done, he got in trouble, and a lot of people got hurt in the process. So what have we learned? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us, so if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. What happened to David can happen to any of us. Baloney gives four things that happen with discouragement. Discouragement will come when we try to face the problems of life in our own strength. Compromise with the world offers only a temporary solution to our problems. You know, it sounds great at first, but it's just temporary. Number three, God's punishment is usually to let us face the consequences of our own wrong decisions. And number four, discouragement is not meant to throw us on our back, but to bring us to our knees. The Lord knows his own. He puts his seal on us, and he watches every move that we make. And when we decide to live in our own strength, God lets us go our own way in order that when we fail, and we will fail eventually, we will turn to him with a new resolve and a firm commitment to walk in the light. Some of us have done exactly what David did, and some of us are still doing it. Remember at the beginning of the message, I said there was a pastor who wrote a sermon on this, and he called it a missing persons report. So where's God been in your life lately? Is God there front and center in the decisions that you're making? Is he helping you so that you don't compromise? Or somewhere along the line, have you allowed discouragement to lead you to compromise? Have you felt God's hand correcting you? If so, it's time to stop running. It's time to seek him. It's time to get things right because our God is a God of grace. When the United States Army entered World War II in 1941, movie legend Jimmy Stewart enlisted in the Army Air Corps. Stewart's father, Alex, was a devoted Christian. He loved the Lord and he had faith in him, and he wrote his son this beautiful, tender note, one of the most beautiful notes I've heard a dad write a son. And it sounds so un-1941-ish. Most of the time when I think of dads in that period, it's kind of, hey, I'm going to keep my kids at an arm's length, but that wasn't Jimmy Stewart's dad. He wrote, my dear Jim boy, soon after you read this letter, you'll be on your way to the worst sort of danger. Jim, I'm banking on the enclosed copy of the 91st Psalm. The thing that takes the place of fear and worry is the promise of these words. I am staking my faith in these words. I feel sure that God will lead you through this mad experience. I can say no more. I only continue to pray. Goodbye, my dear. God bless you and keep you. I love you more than I can tell you, Dad. Jimmy Stewart would return home a decorated war hero. He flew in over 20 combat missions. He eventually became a brigadier general. And he later told his dad, what a promise. I placed my, he said, I placed in God's hands the squadron that I would be leading. And as the psalmist promised, I felt myself worn out. Jimmy Stewart's dad could have taught the 29-year-old David a thing or two. He sure could teach me a thing or two as well. We need to trust in our God. Listen, God's will is going to be accomplished with or without us. I sure hope that, unlike David, you'll get to the spot where you yield yourself to his will from the beginning, that we would allow him to accomplish his will with us. I want to close with one story. There was a shipwrecked man, true story, who... Uh, reached an uninhabited island, and he was there for a while, kind of a modern-day, you know, story of the whole Tom Hanks, you know, castaway story. But to protect himself against the elements and to safeguard the few possessions that he'd salvaged, he painstakingly built a little hut. And every night, he'd return to that evening, and he'd build himself a little fire and um, 
cook up what he had. And one night he came home after searching for food and realized that his hut had burned up, that the fire had gotten out of control, and he was as discouraged as he could be. He finally fell asleep under a tree, and early the following morning, he awoke with a ship anchored off the island. And when the captain, the following morning, awoke him, he said, we saw your smoke signal and we came. Even when God seems absent, he's at work, taking even our mistakes and weaving them into the tapestry of his perfect will. He blesses us in spite of our blunders. Sure glad that's the God we serve. Run with him. Run with him and trust him. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a God of grace. Thanks for the story of David. His uh, life teaches us much. And God, I thank you that in your graciousness, you allowed him to look up. It was never too late for David to look up. And so God, in those moments where we're tempted to live in a way that is anything but glorifying to you, help us to trust you. Help us to place our lives squarely in your hands and to be willing to go no matter where it is that you may lead us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Let's stand and close in a couple songs together.